I uh, trust everyone got a good night of sleep. I trust that you enjoyed the youth's coffee bar this morning. Give them a big hand, Matthew Malia, for leading that. Yep. Trust you have a little caffeine in your system. <laughs> I know I need it. This particular passage that we're talking about this morning and that uh, it, it, it's, it's a little stressful. Is that fair? Is that fair? To two of you. Is that fair? Yeah, all right. Take your Bibles. Turn them to Romans chapter 1. I'm not putting it on the screen this morning. I'm going to make you do some reading. If you have an app that gives you different translations, I am reading out of the NIV, so it might make it a little bit easier to follow along. If you have an NIV or if you have an app that way, uh, go ahead and turn it to that. What I realized is, though, sometimes in life you have to be willing to talk about things that we n not necessarily want to talk about or that are in enjoyable to talk about and that's what Paul is giving us here in Romans chapter 1 it's one of those subjects that's not much fun at all I'm going to give you a little bit of a story I don't know uh, some of you charter members and people who have been here for quite some time remember that back in about uh, it had to be in the fall of 2017 I started with severe back pain and it got to the point how many remember I could barely walk up the stairs here uh, there were mornings that I, I just about couldn't get up onto the stage and I dealt with this thing for two and a half years. I remember we went uh, to the relief bus over in New York City. And I don't know if Leon and Julie are here or not. But Julie was trying to step me through all kinds of different stretches and, you know, CrossFit stuff. And uh, it didn't help. And I went to doctor after doctor. I went, I did x-rays. I did MRIs. I did all sorts of, I've, I've seen every chiropractor in Northeast Ohio. I even had one guy who put kitty litter bags on my midsection with a rag around my head and yanked me like that. Still a little loose up there. I did everything. I even went to the Cleveland Clinic and had him stick a syringe in my back between my L4 and L5 and they did some kind of epidural. I wasn't having a baby, but that's what it was. And it didn't help. I was defeated and I felt so down. I was so depressed about it. I mean, come on. I'm trying to be the pastor of a church. I'm trying to run a business that's failing. I'm trying to be a dad, a good dad, not just a dad. I'm trying to be a good husband, which that I accomplished. Stress. Stress. This isn't an altar call, but stress, right? Someone turned me on to this lady doctor. Don't ask questions. And I go there. She starts evaluating me. She weighed me. She took a blood test. And I left for the weekend. This was now right in the heart of COVID. And I got an email while I was gone. Call me when you get back. Zoom call me. So I did a Zoom thing. And she looked into that camera and she goes, you know what's wrong with you? How many want to guess? She said, it's you. I said, there ain't no way that my hip hurts like this. I mean, there were times that I could not pull my socks on. Becky had to do it with tears running down my face. There's no way that my back hurts that bad, and it's me. God healed me, but it came through some things that I had to do in my life. I, had to, I was the heaviest I had ever been. I had a horrible, horrible blood sugar level at 44 years old. My life, my, I wasn't taking care of myself. Does that make sense? 
I was worried about everybody else. I wasn't taking care of myself. And in that, I became a miserable, hurting person. And all the whole time, it was me. And so I changed some things in my life. Simple things. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that I had a needle put in my back. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that I was on prescriptions. It was me. Y'all good with that? Two of you. Are you good with that? I mean, I can pull my socks on. I could almost do a backflip up. You want to see it? Like, I feel great. I worked on myself. You ready to read Romans? It never was the stress of the church. It never was the stress of the store or being a dad or being a husband. It was me. And as we read what, Roman, what Paul writes here in Romans, I want you to keep that story in your mind, okay? I'm gonna say some things this morning that some of you might not like, but I will come back to the fact of this. That the problems that we're facing in our world today and in our culture today and in our families today and in our lives and around us in our communities, the problems that we're facing, I believe it with my whole heart, we're the problem. We, we need to work on us as a church, as Christ-believing disciples and followers of Jesus. It's us. It, there is not a legislative law. There is no same-sex marriage law. There is no abortion law that can be put into place to protect us and make us better. It is a heart issue. I'm done. Y'all enjoy the rest of your day. Y'all got this, right? That's kind of what I found when I read this section of the letter of Romans chapter 1. It was amazing to me. All of a sudden it dawned on me that this is me. It's me. I'll be the first to tell you when I preach this message. It's, I'm talking to me first, but if you want to listen, you can. This is serious stuff. The issues in our culture aren't about laws. If we had another law to do this, we would be better people. No, it starts with us. And there's a system in place, there's a formula that Paul uses here that I believe we can get so much out of. There's, a, there's this, just this constant, or this, um, if, if, how, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it's an, a gradual going away from God, and then in the back part of it, he says it three times that he gives us over to that. He actually gives us over to that. We exchange something, and when you exchange something, it, I'll get to the script here in a minute, but when we, we swap it out, and when we swap something, that becomes our God, that becomes our idol, that becomes our worship. That's what we start worshiping. And it leaves no room for God. And if you read, let's read it. I'll get way off of off. So today we're studying in Romans. We see that Paul, I believe very much inspired by the Holy Spirit, he's actually the doctor in this case. If you want to go back to my uh, example of my life, Paul is the doctor, not only of the human soul, but of the society that we live in and society in general. And I believe he can tell us exactly in the next 14 verses, I believe he will tell us <coughs> what the problem is of the world is today. And I want you to be prepared to look in a mirror. Romans chapter one, we're gonna ver read verses 18 through 22. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness. So I'm going to, in my translation here, I'm going to change those words, godlessness and wickedness. I'm gonna change them to ungodliness to ungodliness, it's easier to remember, and then the other one, wickedness, I want you to change that to unrighteousness. And I want you to use this idea in your head that ungodliness 
ungodliness is the relationship that we have with God. And if that relationship up and down, the one that comes down into us from God, if that is exchanged or misplaced or something else is in, our, in that place, right, then our unrighteousness, which is the way that we act in life, the way that we live our life from day to day, the way that we treat other human beings, the way that we love other human beings, you following me? The way that we act it out, that's our unrighteousness or righteousness. So that, our, our way of acting it out or our way of living our lives, so to speak, is definitely 100% affected by our ungodliness or godliness and the degree of that. Whatever that measures to be in your life. Does that make sense? You still with me? Nobody walked out yet. Let's keep going. And wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what be, may be made known about God is plain to them. Somebody say it's plain to us. Because God has made it plain to them. Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, that's his eternal power and his divine nature, they have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Say, I'm without an excuse. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 22, and I'll quit for a little bit. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. <coughs> Now, back in verse 16, where Matthew was last Sunday, Paul made a statement that he is not ashamed of the gospel. And let's take it back, and you are now in 33 AD, basically, where Paul was writing this letter. And you have to know that people were saying in that time, they were, they were actually wondering, well, why would God send Jesus down to, I mean, come on, that's a far-fetched story. That he would come down in the form of a man and he would take upon himself the sins of the world and die on the cross to save us from our sins. That's a far-fetched story. And in that time, it was right up against the time that it happened. They were questioning it. And Paul said, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What is the gospel? We determined that the first year on the first message. The gospel is what? It's the good It's the good news. Why would he not be ashamed of the good news? If he's not ashamed of the good news, there had to be a very good reason why he's not ashamed of that good news. Does that make sense? Am I making, are you tracking with me? Paul is saying he's not ashamed of the fact that Jesus would need to come. And he tells us why it was necessary. We're going to get to a really big list towards the end of Romans chapter 1 here. And I promise you without a shadow of a doubt that everyone in this room will fall under one of those categories. The first one he talks about is same sex, attraction. Why does he do that? We'll get into that. Why does he make that parallel first? Why does he make that example first? Why does he make that comparison first? Because after he gets done talking about that, he makes a list that none of us can, none of us can outlive. Some of you are in every one of the categories, but all of us are in some. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Jesus had to come. Why did he have to come? We'll get to that. God's anger, his wrath at the world is revealed, it says, in heaven. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godlessness or the, un, uh, the ungodly or the wickedness, which is the unrighteousness of the people. So, in other words, his wrath is being sent out of heaven. It would be revealed from heaven because of our lack of our commitment to him. Because that results in the way that we live it out. And he was angry about it. And he knew, I mean, you think about what God had to think about when he said, he's a perfect God, he is a just God, he is complete and he, it, no sin can enter into his realm, and yet here he created us. He puts us on this. At that point was a perfect earth, and the first thing we do is mess it up. 
And so there was this anger there. There was this wrath there that had to be revealed and it had to be appeased. And that's why Jesus came. He had to come to take care of that as a propitiation for our sins to appease the wrath of God. Does that make sense? Tracking with me? So you have God's righteousness, which is great news. That's what he's so unashamed to talk about, and that's in Jesus. But the reason Jesus had to come is because we have a major, major problem here on earth. Not only is God's righteousness being revealed, but his wrath is being revealed as well because he is a perfect God. So we have established that the unrighteousness or the ungodliness that he's talking about here is the relationship with God and the unrighteousness is the relationship with humans. That's where we have it all messed up because he is angry about the way that we live out our lives when we're not in full commitment and full worship to him. That would be, and Paul doesn't leave us hanging, but I had to think if I went to that doctor and she would have said, hey, this was the, every one that I went to that prescribed me anything from my shot to my medication, whatever it was that they gave me, they always told me that this is the reason you're taking this. And I would never, ever, ever trust a physician who would give me a prescription and not tell me what the problem is. Okay? So Paul's going to tell us what the problem is. He jumps right in. He says, I'm not ashamed of Jesus. That's the prescription. Jesus is the prescription, but I'm not ashamed of the prescription, the gospel. But now I want you to know why he is so important. First of all, God's wrath is revealed from heaven against godlessness and unrighteousness. And then who suppresses the truth by their wickedness. So what does he say is the problem? We're the problem. You say, why? Why do you say that? It says it right here because... Those who suppress the truth. What does suppress mean? It means to keep something down. It means to not let it come out and not let it come forth. I had to think there was a, a little boy. Their family got a new puppy. Any new puppies? Somebody was giving away kitties over in Winesburg this weekend. Like free cats to all. And I'm like, oh my. Reminded me of this story. The little puppy that came to the family's house. And... The, they made a rule that the puppy would sleep in the garage, never to come inside overnight. They could play with him, and the kids could play with him in, inside during the day, but he had to sleep out in the garage. And the little boy felt sorry for the puppy, and so the first night walks out into the garage, grabs the puppy, and brings it to bed. Well, of course, you know, there's some noises being made, and all of a sudden he hears his dad coming down the hall. And so he grabs the puppy, and he puts him in the toy box. And the puppy starts whimpering and the tail's wagging and thump, thump, thumping in the toy box. And he sits down on top of it. And about that time, the door of the bedroom opens and the dad comes in and the boy is talking out loud. He's speaking really loud so that the dad doesn't find out that the puppy's in the toy box. That's suppressing the truth. That's suppressing the truth. It's the same for us. We suppress the truth. We, we want to hold it down. We don't want to let it come out. This is the first step towards what Paul is saying is a result of the, of the diagnosis. Am I making sense? Like this is the first step that happens is we start to suppress the truth. We don't want to, even though we know the truth, we, won't, we don't want to embrace the truth. We don't really want to live it out. It's not really what we want to do. It's not comfortable for us. And so we suppress it down. It can come in the form of forgiveness. Sometimes we have to forgive people. Hey, I've got people I have to forgive every day. It's none of you. Every day. And I don't know, I hope I get over it someday. But I have to bring it to God every day. And I have to forgive. Because I don't want to suppress the truth. When we can't forgive each other, that is a suppression of truth. Amen? Amen? When we, okay, Jesus says to love our enemies. That's a, that's a command of his. And when we can't love our enemies, we're suppressing the truth. He also says to judge that you be not judged. That was the words of Jesus. And when we judge people, 
Some of the people we're going to read about here soon. When we judge those people and we cut them down and we slander them, we're suppressing the truth. And the problem with our humanity today is the truth is evident, but we suppress it. We don't want to let it out. We want to keep it quiet. And it comes out through our actions. It, in other words, our unrighteousness, our works, how we live, how we treat, how we, how we love people, and how we use people. Verses 19 through 20 says this, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So not only do we suppress the truth, right? But we also ignore revelation, so to speak. And Brennan was bringing that out in the song that he sang this morning called Evidence. It's all around us. The creation that God made, there is so much evidence that God exists. I have uh, this whole week, this thing has been on my mind, and I've just been kind of taking in <clears throat> all of God's creation and just enjoying it a little bit more and paying a little bit more uh, attention to it, being more intentional with my thoughts of how creation is. Last night, we sat on our deck. And we watched deer, we watched coon, we watched, we even had a wild turkey. I hunted all season long and didn't get one. And one was in my backyard last night. And this morning, there was a coon on my deck eating my bird feed at 3.30. I don't know if God created him or not, but I know who's going to take him out. It's all around us. And see, back in Matthew chapter, help me out, five, I think it is, Beatitudes, Matthew five, scholar, I think, yeah. Matthew five, verse eight, I think it is. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall what? See God, where? Carson, I see him in you. I hear him in you. When I see your eyes and I have a contact with you and a relationship with each other and I hear voices back and forth, there's communication. I know that there's God. I see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Why do you think he said that? Blessed are the pure in heart. That is also a reflection, in my opinion, of this. Making God our focus. An infallible incorruptible God making him our worship. Am I making sense? And when we do that, we will see God in everything and everyone, including the ones we're getting ready to name. And so, <laughs> I know, I know, makes us uncomfortable. We get a little homophobic. Oh my. But if we, if we keep our relationship with God the way that it's supposed to be, then we can see God in everything and know that he created them. And maybe it's our fault as a church. Maybe we need to take more responsibility for the way that our culture is drumming up to be. We ignore the revelation. We don't want to see what God has created for us. He says, what may be known of God is plain to them. You guys recited that back to me. It's plain to you. So it's basically, it's evident to us. The evidence, the song we sang, it's evident to us. You may say, well, where did he show me the truth? And it says here, it goes on, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. So out of all of that, everything that he made, we can gain that truth. That revelation that he is 
the one and only true God. We as humans, we live in this world, we're capable of perceiving those types of things around in our environment, and sometimes we choose not to. I meet people that I wonder if God actually created them. Fact of the matter is, he did. They've just been a little misled, and maybe it's my fault. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So see first, the first problem is we suppress the truth. And then we choose not to see the revelation of God. I tell you what, as I, I told Becky, like, this, this week has just been absolutely beautiful. Sunrises that are just marvelous and sunsets that are even more glorious, right? It, it would take more faith for me to be an atheist than it does to believe in creation. Like, I, I, I don't understand how people can get to that point. I really don't. Unless, as we go further here, you'll see that three times God gives us over. He, we exchange things and he gives us over to it. So when we start suppressing the truth, we start to ignore revelation. He doesn't stop there. If we go to verse 21, everybody have their Bibles? Here's what he says. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him, nor did they give thanks to him. And I will tell you, I, th there are people that I, I was just, uh, yesterday, I was reminded of this, of how negative some people can be. They're ungrateful for everything. As hot as it was yesterday, someone had to complain about it. I loved it. But s there are people, oh, it's so hot. Oh ungrateful the chief way in my opinion to deny the glory of God is to be ungrateful it's one of the chief ways thank him for the opportunity thank him for each breath you have thank you thank him for the life that he's given you is it all glorious no but I can promise you you can go around this whole room and everybody would tell you something that they've went through lately or are going through right now that is worse than yours somebody want to tell us I'm just saying, we need to be grateful. God created us to give him glory through thankfulness. And when we're unthankful, it's step three. We've now suppressed the truth. We've ignored the revelation. And now we're not giving him glory. We're denying him the glory that he deserves. We're already at step three. How many know people that are ungrateful? Don't raise your hands. They're probably sitting beside you. We're already on, on step three, and we know people like that. And guess what? I've been like that. Every time we're ungrateful for the moment that God has given us, every single time we're denying him the glory that he deserves. Stop being angry. Start being thankful. So when we suppress the truth, we ignore revelation, we deny glory to God, then what happens? You'll read on and it says you become futile in your thoughts and your hearts become darkened. You claim to be wise, but you become a fool. Those are three, we say, wow, that, just those three steps can lead to your darkening of your heart and making you foolish. And we're all guilty of them at some point or another in our lives. So right there, within those three steps, this is what was revealed to me. I am the problem. When these things creep up in my life, I'm the problem. It's not the stress.
It's not the food I'm eating. I'm the problem. I control that, right? I control this too. These are three things that we can control. We can choose to see God in everything. We can choose to be grateful in everything. And we can choose to give him the glory that he deserves so very, very much. That's the progression of how sin works. And it's so subtle. It's so subtle. It's in our everyday lives. But that's how it works. There's a progression there. Suppressing truth, ignoring revelation, denying glory. Now we have humans, we make these choices. He gives us the right to make a choice. We choose. And so when we choose one thing, we're exchanging it for another thing. And when we're not choosing to worship God in that fashion or to give him glory in that fashion, we are then choosing something else. And then God, it says that God gives us over to the thing that we chose or exchanged it for, and then we start acting out or we start living our lives according to the choices that we've made. Three times God talks about it in the next couple of verses that we're going through. Three times he says that he gives us over. He gives us over. He gives us over for the exchange that we've made of the things that he requires of us. All right, verses 23 through 28. Let's read that. Verse 23, and exchanged the glory. Let's start in 22. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Verse 24, therefore, we know that that word is there for a reason. This is why it's there for. God gave them over since they made that exchange in verse 23. They swapped it. They swapped it. Now, therefore, this is the reason why God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Verse 25, they exchanged the truth. Again, they exchanged, they swapped the truth for a lie, right? Because now all of a sudden, they're not worshiping God the way that they're supposed to, and so they don't quite feel. They're suppressing the truth. Everything's coming around them. They're unthankful for everything, and all of a sudden, this lustful desire feels good. It gives them a pitter-patter in their heart. Uh-oh, that must be the way I'm supposed to go. And God says, you know what? Go. I'll give it over to you. They're exchanging that lie for the truth. Does that make sense? Somebody say something. They exchanged the truth for the lie. And it's basically, okay, well, let's keep going. Verse 25. And worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Verse 26. Because of this, <laughs> here he's giving them over again. This is the second one. God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Verse 27. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over, this is the third one, to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. So in, in very plain words, we start suppressing the truth. We start ignoring the revelation. Then we start denying the glory. And because of that, we begin to worship the wrong things. And by nature, by, by the way he created us, the way we were created, we're going to worship something. We're going to. You will choose an object to worship. We have little statues laying everywhere in our lives, don't we? We say, well, we would never, ever, like, do, get into idol worship or anything like that. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about idolatry, modern-day idolatry. Maybe it's our career. Maybe it's a person, a, a, another human being who makes us happy, and we put them in place of our almighty God. Maybe it's, maybe it's your education. 
There's a whole list of things. I know for me, I had to deal with this. It was my hobbies. <laughs> Telling Riffy earlier today, yeah, I went golfing at one time this past spring, just a couple weeks ago, and I did so well, I took my clubs to Damon, and I said, here, you keep them for the summer. I don't want it. I hadn't golfed in a while, and I was like, wow, this is great. I don't want it. I'm not, hey, listen, golfing's not wrong. That, that is not what I'm saying. Pickleball is. I love you, Griff. I got an amen out of that. Do you know what I'm saying? Hunting's not wrong. Fishing's not wrong. I'm saying when it becomes an idol in our lives. And I will tell you, it's easy to do. Easier for me than it is for y'all. I know it is. But listen, it's easy to do and it comes so subtly. Do you think Satan's going to shove it in your face? No. No. Not at all. He's going to do it very, very sneakily. And the next thing you know, you skipped out on your devotions. You skipped out on your prayer. You skipped out coming to church. <laughs> you skipped out being with your friends. He, he isolates you and he has you worship something other than God. And that's what Paul's saying. That's the things that'll happen. That's the progression of sin. And you think, well, I would never, ever, ever be a homosexual or anything like that. No, that, but he's using that as, the, as, the, as like this radical example. But there's a whole host of other things coming up that I promise you, you can't evade. You can't get around. Things were broken in worship from the beginning. It, it, it even starts back in Exodus. I'm, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it. This is Exodus chapter 20. This is where the Ten Commandments come in. This is where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. You know what the first one was? Let me read it for you. It says this, and God spoke all these words. He's in verse 2, he says, the first, this is the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. So like, let's make it modern day, right? I am the Lord your God who sent Jesus, the Messiah, the good news that, that he was talking about, that Paul was talking about, and he spared you out of Egypt. He has spared you from living a demented, twisted life if you want it. Are y'all with me? And out of the land of slavery. We don't need to be enslaved to these things. And here's the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Somebody say that. You shall have no other gods before me. Let's say it together. You shall have no other. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, God is saying, I, the Lord your God, I am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those. Where am I at? Fourth generation of those who hate me. Verse 6. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That was God's first commandment. First. And he says when you don't do it, when you don't love me first, your second third and fourth up to the fourth generation pay for it and we wonder why our culture and the generation we live in now is messed up like it is y'all want to blame your great great grandfather don't you it's us it's us it's us we're the problem I don't apologize for that, and I won't. 
Idolatry is very much alive today. It comes in forms of positions, titles, wealth, political stance, whatever you want it to be, hobbies, it doesn't matter. It can become an idol in your life. And you need to know, and you need the Holy Spirit to, for discernment of when to let it go and when to slack it off and when to go. Huh? He will give you all truth. That's Scripture. If we truly have a heart of worship, I believe every service would be packed. I believe everyone would be early. Because our God, the God that I serve, He is truly worthy of that and when we get it wrong God gives us over to that verse 24 therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another because our worship is broken we start to live out our sinful lives and our sinful desires We start to view our body as ours. This is ours. You're not going to tell me what to do with it, huh? Y'all know what I'm talking about? There's a group out there doing that right now. You ain't going to tell me what to do. This is my body, my choice. No. See, it's God's. God's God created you and your body. You're, You're God's. We need to worship him. That way, and God gives us over to it. Verses 25 through 27, I'm going to read it again. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped him and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. Verse 27, and in the same way, the men abandoned natural relations with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. See, a brokenness in relationship with God, a broken worship results in a broken nature. What's natural? And it eventually leads us to what we're seeing today. You worship the wrong thing and God gives you over to it. The uncleanness of your heart. And that's how you begin to act it out physically or bodily or however you want to look at it. It's a result of broken relationship with God. We have to choose to keep our desires in check, each and every one of us. And when we don't, God gives us over to those unchecked desires. I believe that's why he used homosexuality, Paul did, as an example I think it's simple to understand. We don't want to talk about it a lot because it's uncomfortable. Some of us are paranoid to talk about it, and that's fine. But if you go back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, it says there that, so God created mankind in his own image, and in the image of God, he created male and female. That's at the beginning of of the Bible. Verse 28, he goes on to say that we are to be fruitful and multiply. That's that's God's command from the beginning. And I think Paul was just trying, as he used this as an example, I think it was prevalent in that day as well. I think it was trying to make a point. Like, this is so far off the path for something so natural. Congratulations, Matthew and Malia, by the way. Be fruitful and multiply. Give them a hand. They're, they're, yeah, absolutely. And whoever else is expecting here, congratulations. I always said if we can't grow the church any other way, we'll do it organically. Nature. Na- what's natural will be distorted. It'll be brokenness in nature when our brokenness in worship is first. I think we need to all be very, very careful what we worship and how we worship it and make sure that God is the focus of our worship. Amen? 
our culture today, boy, they're stuffing it down our throats like you don't believe. It's a tough time to raise a family, Matthew. I'm going to pray over that God would bless you with the wisdom and all of you other parents, that, that God would bless you with wisdom of how to raise your child. Because I'm telling you, if you're not influencing them, someone else is. Because this culture is very, very determined to get it in the door of our homes, to get it in the door of our churches, to get it in our, our they want to make it something that's common. And it's as far from natural as I believe you could get. And I believe that's why Paul uses it as the example. That's the extreme. But he goes on. He's not done. He's far from finished. I'm almost finished. Verses 28 through 32. Furthermore, Brennan, you can bring your team up. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind. And you're like, oh boy, you yeah, have some twisted individuals. Listen, guys, this isn't, I don't believe we're called as a church to judge them and hate them and to be belittling of it or joke about it. I, I'm guilty. I have made some, I made a comment here one time that I should have never made. And if you were here, I'm not going to say it again, but if you were here and you found it offensive, I'm sorry. I apologize. I was held accountable to it. But I, it's not a place, it's not a, it's not a time in our culture and it's not a time to judge it to hate the people. Does that make sense? We need to love them. And we're, we're responsible as Christians. It says he gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. In verse 29, they have become with every, filled with every kind of wickedness. You can stand. And here's where Paul Starts on the way out here, what we would feel is way extreme, right? But then he brings it back in to where <laughs> there's not a person in this seat today that, 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 that one of these doesn't hit you. You want to hear them or you want to go home? Let's hear them. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. Even my 10-year-old likes to deceive me. Tries. Malice. They gossip. They are gossips. Don't all come to the front at once. Slanderers, God haters. Oh, that wouldn't be any of us. But you fit in there if you have an idol that takes its place in worship to Him. Insolent, arrogant. <laughs> Drop the mic. Boastful. Mm. And they invent ways of doing evil. Uh-oh, youth, listen up. They disobey their parents. It's right there. They didn't leave you out. Paul didn't leave you out. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. In other words, no forgiveness, no grace. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death. We all know that, right? They not only continue to do those things, but they also approve of those who practice them.
I'll sum it up this way. The progression of sin. You want to hear it? You first start suppressing the truth and then you start ignoring the actual revelation of God. And then you deny him the glory he deserves by being ungrateful. And then you become unthankful. And then that exchange turns in, you trade it into something that God gives you over to that thing and it leads you into your way of life. It leads you to a brokenness in worship and you start worshiping the wrong things. It leads you to a wrong way of identifying yourself and how you view yourself. You can't do it anymore because you don't have the direct connection with God. You have a false view of nature, things that are supposed to be natural. You start to get a false view of that. And eventually, it'll lead you into a false way to live. And when, when I read the list that he has here, believe me, I get hit with some of the things that he says. I'm not exempt from that just because I'm your pastor. I think all of us, it hits us somewhere. But I want to be like Paul. And I want the verse that Matthew preached on last week about not being ashamed of the gospel. I, I want to proclaim Jesus in my life. And I want it to be, my life to be a direct reflection of what God is doing for me, in me, through me. And you imagine a church, a body of believers that would all get on that same page and say, you know what? We will make the incorruptible God our focus of worship. Nothing else matters. And in that way, we can change the world and we can change the culture. So I will tell you, the problem's not with the culture. It's with us. Let's bow our heads.